you know, I have a ton of needs, but I meet them largely on my own. You know, I, I, I am able to advocate for them in a pretty low drama way because I don't judge them mm. like I used to. And so the more that I make space for my needs in my life, the less like quote unquote needy. Cause I used to be that, that, that needy, you know, it was like, it spilled out everywhere. I didn't want to take responsibility for my needs. So I wanted everybody else to meet them and I didn't want to meet them. You know, it was like, I, it, it was really uncontained in that way. And the more that I learned how to take care of them myself, which, you know, no person's an island. That doesn't mean I do everything by myself, but even just taking responsibility for advocating for them. Um, the less dramatic it was. Hey everyone, I'm Thais Sky. Welcome to Reclaim, a podcast for women by women on conversations that matter. Hello, hello everybody. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. I am your host, Thais Sky, here in Los Angeles for another beautiful day. That's the nice thing about LA. It's always beautiful. And no, no, I have not gotten tired of it. After three years of beautiful weather, 95% of the time, I have to admit, I have not yet gotten tired of it. I haven't gotten tired of the palm trees. I've not gotten tired of the ocean. This city is my home, and I love being here so very much. Um, But that's not the point at all of this podcast. I don't know why I just went into a loving LA rant. I am... Um, about to share a really powerful interview with you all with Mara Glatzel. So Mara and I have uh, known each other online for a few years, and I love, love, love her work. And I love that she talks about neediness because this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, Neediness is deeply connected with people pleaser. It's deeply connected with the worthiness wound. So, of course, I've spent quite a few number of years exploring it. And I think many women who kind of know what they want and are ambitious and go-getter can be either not needy at all, like too independent and have issues with um, being in attachment, or they fall on the other side of the spectrum where they really deny their needs and um, in their denial of their needs, they actually come off very needy. And so I guess what both of these women, both of these spectrums have in common is that there's unrecognized needs there and recognizing, owning and labeling and um, understanding our needs and then putting a stake in in the land and saying, this is what I need from ourselves and from people in our lives. It's so liberatory. It's a way that we can take up space that honors our being. It's a really important thing. And so in this conversation with Mara, we have just a really beautiful dialogue on neediness and people pleasing and manipulation and how we can navigate this very complex topic uh, in a way that allows us to own our, our power and reclaim our sovereignty in the world. So as you're listening to this interview, I want you to be thinking about your own relationship with neediness. What does neediness mean to you? What does it mean for you when you hear um, to meet your needs or to take care of your needs? You know, what has um, your relationship with your needs been in the past? And how would you like to approach your needs in the future? Okay, you got those questions? Let me introduce Mara to you. Uh, Mara Glatzo is an intuitive guide and energy worker for women who are yearning to belong to themselves. In her work and on her podcast, Needy, that's right, Mara has a podcast called Needy. You can get the link to it on the show notes. Uh, Mara facilitates daily conversations about identifying, honoring, and advocating for your needs. At the core of her work is a desire to live a well-intentioned life, which means more joy, grit, and vibrant imperfection to spare. So you can learn more about Mara and her work at maraglatzel.com. You can also go to my show notes and you will get all of the links to that. Let's bring her on and let's talk about neediness.
Hello, hello, Mara. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh my God, I'm so excited. I feel like I don't know when I was first introduced to you. Do you remember when you were first introduced to me? I don't, but I feel like it was several iterations ago for both uh, of us. <laughs> exactly. A hundred percent. I feel like it was a while ago. I feel like people just keep bringing you into my sphere. You know, people keep saying, oh, you've got to know her. You've got to know her work. Um, and so it's so, so, so thrilling that I'm finally here with you and having a conversation with you. Absolutely. Well, I feel the same. It's like everything you post on social media, everything you write about, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. yes. Same, <laughs> so same. I'm really happy to be here with you today and yes. getting to hang out with your community. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Okay. So for people who are not familiar with you and your work, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I am a coach who lives on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And I work primarily with women around figuring out what they need and how to ask for it. And, you know, most often these are conversations that you're having with yourself because before we even begin to have conversations about advocating for our needs, we're advocating for our needs just within our own bodies, our own minds and taking up space there first. Mm. So I run a podcast called Needy, which is all about needs. Um, and yeah, that's the, the core of my work is about helping women in particular take up more space in mm. their lives mm. and, and learn how to honor themselves and honor the energy expenditure that they're putting into their lives every single day by also figuring out how to balance that in some, you know, balance is such a ridiculous word, but, you know, balance that in some sort of way with how they're taking care of themselves so that yes. they don't get to a point where they're totally burned out and unable to continue doing the things that they love to do with their lives. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love that you have a podcast called Needy. You know, being called Needy is something that um, is often placed as a, as a bad thing. Like, oh, you're so demanding on my time. Like you're taking up too much space. And yet, the odds of us actually taking up too much space is so small <laughs> compared to how much space we actually take up. You know what I mean? I feel like women were so conscious, constantly aware of how much space we're taking up. And I've read somewhere that like, if a woman talks like 30% of the time, the people in the room think that they're talking something like 60 to 70% of the time. And that's the opposite is true for men. And, and that, ah, it's such important work what you're doing. Oh, thank you. I agree. And you know, it's so interesting because I find that we become our neediest, like quote unquote neediest, that, that, that needy that nobody wants to be. Uh, when we aren't taking responsibility for our own needs. Yes. And we think that we can push them to the sides of our life. We think that they won't matter, but, you know, your needs will be met. And whether that's resentment that kind of pours itself into your relationships or, you know, other consequences of pretending like you're the one person on the planet who doesn't have needs. Mm -hmm. Um those needs are already a part of our lives. And when we're not paying attention to them, we're not taking responsibility for them, we're not honoring them in any real way, then they become problematic. Yes. You know, I have a ton of needs, but I meet them largely on my own. You know, I, I, I am able to advocate for them in a pretty low drama way because I don't judge them mm. like I used to. And so the more that I make space for my needs in my life, the less like quote unquote needy. Cause I used to be that, that, that needy, you know, it was like, it spilled out everywhere. I didn't want to take responsibility for my needs. So I wanted everybody else to meet them and I didn't want to meet them. You know, it was like, I, it, it was really uncontained in that way. And 
the more that I learned how to take care of them myself, which, you know, no person's an island. That doesn't mean I do everything by myself, but even just taking responsibility for advocating for them, um, the less dramatic it was. Mm. Ah, I think that that speaks to so many parts of ourselves the more we tend to all sorts of different wounds and emotional experiences we have, the less dramatic any of them are, the, the more we have autonomy in taking up space versus taking up space from a place of compulsion. Mm-hmm. I love that. And I'm curious how you now, like how did you get into this conversation of neediness and meeting your needs? What were your challenges um, that called you into this work? Well, I'm a really needy person. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when I was making my needs everybody else's problem, I was constantly seeking external validation. I, it, you know, feeling loved was a primary concern. But of course, you know, when I didn't love myself, no amount of love that anyone else could give me was enough. So it's like Mm -hmm. a bottomless pit. And, and also I felt so embarrassed about myself. You know, I felt so embarrassed that I couldn't just get it together and I couldn't just be a person who could keep going without resting or could keep going without sitting down for food. And I reached a point in my life where I became really burned out, like burned out to the point where I couldn't live my life the way that I had been living it. And in a very um, significant way. And, you know, I remember coming home one day from work. I was in social work school at the time and I came home from work and my partner had made me dinner and wanted to, talk to me about my day. And I was just like, can we just sit here and eat and watch TV? Like I cannot care about you basically. And Mm. I can't care about anything basically Mm. because I was just so full. I was so full of things that I thought that I was supposed to do. I was so full of who I thought I was supposed to be. And something that I realized was that my life what I mean, no, no part of my life was really my own. That mm. everything that I did was kind of dictated by what I thought I should do and what was best. And of course, that that belief system also had me working at a kind of chaotic and um, uh, damaging speed. Yeah, and taking responsibility for everybody else's stuff and not taking responsibility for my own. And it was kind of through that experience and through really realizing that that wasn't how I wanted to live my life. And also that people didn't really know me. You know, I was making myself so small so that I could have positive interactions with people because I was trying to manage myself so that I could have positive relationships because I thought I had to make myself small in order to be liked and loved. Mm -hmm. But really, that was keeping me from knowing anybody including my partner who I was about to get married to. Mm. And, you know, I suddenly realized that my life wasn't working. My my relationships weren't working. And I was really the problem because by pretending that I didn't have any needs, by pretending that, um, you know, by believing that I had to earn affection and earn all of my relationships really. Um, yeah, I just got to this point where it was like things that, you know, things stopped working completely. And so one of the reasons that I do this work is that I don't, I don't want anybody to get to that place Yeah, where things really don't work, you know, where you're looking around at a life and you don't recognize yourself in any of it. I'm super happy to work with people who are in that place, of course, but You know, I figure the more that I talk about needs, the better that I'm doing my job, you know, the more that people are able to realize that they require things from themselves and from the world around them and that there's no shame in that before Mm -hmm. they hit that point of emergency. Mm -hmm. And 
Yeah. And that was it's a hard lesson for me to learn. Um, it's a hard lesson for me. I'm always learning it, you know, to, to only take responsibility for the things that are mine to own. Uh, I imagine will be a lifelong lesson. For me. Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I think I'm going to blame Venus retrograde because I, you know, why not? Uh, <laughs> with Venus retrograde, I've become viscerally aware of my relationships and how I take up space in my relationships. And I've noticed I'm not a people pleaser to strangers. Um, and that's kind of how I assumed people, like when you say, oh, you're a people pleaser, I'm like, well, I don't really feel the need to like contort myself to strangers in this way, blah, blah, blah. And by doing that, I wasn't looking at how people pleasing applies in different ways, right? Because when we make it one definition, well, if that definition doesn't fit me, then that must not be me. And the, by expanding what people pleaser means, I started to recognize how often in my interpersonal relationships, I diminish my needs, diminish my, my voice, diminish the space I can take up because I so desperately want the other person to feel comfortable, to feel safe, to feel heard, to feel loved. And then how that makes my needs getting met kind of out of my control. I kind of have to then hope and pray that somebody will be then say, oh, Thais, you've been so selfless and loving and perfect. Here, let me tend to your needs now. And funny enough, Mara, it doesn't work. I know, mind-blowing concept. Um, yeah. And that, that has been such a striking experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how that works. Uh, I would say I, my experience has been really similar. And, you know, that feeling of if I'm doing a good enough job, somebody will notice that I need to be taken care of too. Yes. And, you know, having nobody notice, I, I made that correlation where nobody Nobody was prioritizing my needs and therefore they must not matter. Yeah. And just how quickly that lent itself to further suppression of my needs, right? Because then yes. I was even more embarrassed about them because, well, if nobody else notices or cares, I must really be making something out of nothing. And it's interesting because, you know, sometimes how that shows up is with so much resentment and yes, you know, it's funny because I, I know for myself, it was, you know, if, <laughs> it became sort of this thing where if I had to ask, it wasn't worth having, you know, yes. if I had to ask for my to me, but I was already embarrassed. Yes. You know, if somebody didn't guess what I needed. I equated that them reading my mind with them loving me. Exactly. And oh. that's tr so slippery. It's the slippery mm -hmm. slope because they're not reading your mind because they're not a mind reader. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with how good your needs are or whether or not they're important or whether or not they would even, I mean, you know, maybe they want to meet your needs. Maybe they have the capacity to help you meet your needs. Maybe not. That's sort of a separate conversation, but until everybody's needs are on the table, we don't even really know what we're talking about. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, I hear this often. It's like, Oh, I don't want to, tell my partner to buy me flowers because that kind of removes the excitement of receiving flowers. Like I just want them to buy me flowers. And it's like, yes. And if you don't ask for what you want and you never get flowers, how is that going to make you feel? Mm -hmm. And it's resentment. You're going to feel resentful. You're going to feel like that person doesn't care, doesn't love you because he's not, he or she is not able to read your mind and give you what you think, you know, what, what you want, because you're not asking for it. Absolutely. And, you know, I think there's a go around for that where you can say, you know, I've said this to my partner on many an occasion. I thrive on words of affirmation. I love love notes. 
I do not feel good when I have to ask for a love note. So like at a separate time, I might say Mm. it would make me feel really good if this was something that you could do for me at a time when I'm not expecting it. Mm. Like don't do it right now Mm -hmm. because I just talked to you about it. Like the, the thing that makes me feel good is that I'm expressing this to you and you remember Mm -hmm. and utilize it at a time when I least expect it. Yeah. And so we can advocate for ourselves without, I don't know, without having it be (laughs) ruining the surprise completely. I mean, if I think about it in reverse, I love to know how somebody loves to be loved. Yes. Like if you tell me this makes me feel so good, then yeah, I'm going to do that for you. And sometimes, sure. I mean, sometimes if I'm paying really close attention, I could guess what that thing is. And sometimes not, you know, because we're all complex human beings who have this whole, you know, matrix of life experience up until this point when we've met. And some of the things I'm going to know about you by paying attention, some of the things I'm not. And so you know, I never feel put out when somebody points me in the right direction. In fact, you know, it makes me feel trusted and it makes me feel good that I know that I can do something that's going to make them feel loved. And so I think the more that we can allow that for ourselves as well, the more opportunities that we're going to have to have our needs met. Yeah. So why don't we do that? Well, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things is that we have an assumption that um, if we have to say it, that other person doesn't want to do it. You know what I mean? Like if we have to ask for it, they have already thought, well, I could do this for this person, but I don't want to, so I'm not going to, Mm. which is not necessarily true. It may not have occurred to them. You know, other people, shockingly, other people aren't thinking about us as much as we are thinking about ourselves. I'm feeling personally attacked right now, so (laughs) thank you for that. (laughs) I mean, it's like, well, you know, and this happens all the time. We feel self-conscious. We think other people are noticing something about us or, you know, thinking something about us, and we may be noticing or thinking that about ourselves, but more often than not, other people are busy with their own stuff. Mm -hmm. So having to point something out to them isn't necessarily a bad thing, doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, they don't, they don't want to. But, you know, I think for so many of us, I started doing this work around needs um, after the birth of my daughter. And part of why I did that work is because all of a sudden I realized that, you know, here's my daughter expressing her needs the way a newborn can, which is, you know, through yelling. And, 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 and she has a really imperfect person on the other side of her needs being met. And just how tender, even from the, our first day on the planet, expressing our needs and having other people need to be responsible for some part of them mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. because, you know, she doesn't know if I'm tired. She doesn't know if I have something else going on. She doesn't know, you know, if I have postpartum depression, she doesn't know, you know, anything It's like, she just starts to encode. I cried for this thing and nobody came or I cried for this thing and nobody understood me. And, you know, just, it occurred to me, how many experiences I'd had over the course of my life where it felt so vulnerable to ask. And, you know, we're all imperfect. So we all show up to our relationships imperfectly. And that means that sometimes needs are advocated for and they fall flat or is triggering to the other person. And, you know, there's a conflict and, you know, that so often we encode that we we carry the experiences of that um, as there being something wrong with us. Mm-hmm. And so fast forward all the way to adulthood, we have this huge, you know, <laughs> uh, bag full of experiences. 
And, you know, when we're feeling uncomfortable or when we're feeling nervous about asking for something, those are the things that we remember. Yeah. Yes. I'm just thinking about all of, you know, the ways that my mother imperfectly showed up for me in my childhood and how defining those moments are because they are our first moments. You know, I'm in grad school now for, to get my master's in clinical psych and all of, all of our psychology is basically dictated upon how well the mother responds to our needs Mm -hmm. in those critical first years. And Mm -hmm. that is so much pressure on the mother. And that's also so much pressure on the child to, um, to expect to like, to, to have like basic core functionings like food and water be placed as something that you cannot give to yourself. And so of course, the minute we can start giving it to ourselves, well, we would rather do that than to be dependent on somebody else. And then of course that gets perpetuated by our individualistic culture. And pretty soon we're all operating under this context that needing other people is bad. Being interdependent is bad. Being dependent, dependency in any way, shape or form is bad. Get your needs met, you know, and, and stop being a crybaby about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the more that everybody around us is doing that, the more that story gets reinforced. Yes. You know, it's part of the reason I started my podcast is because so many of my clients were saying to me, like, I don't know anybody who admits to having needs. Yes. Which is alarming. (laughs) I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, and and if you just think about how, how shameful must that thing be that we never talk about. And, and also you know, how often we're praised for pulling the all-nighter, sacrificing our our needs in order to get something done, Um, you know, working late, uh, piling things on, you know, that we we earn so much uh, validation socially for not having needs. Yeah. Yeah, it's just wild. And of course, the answer, the the irony then is, of course, we don't ask for what we want. We're so selfless in giving other people what they want. But that's not the end of the story, is it, Mara? Because <laughs> then we develop resentment that that other person is not giving us what we want. We, we develop this judgment around, well, why am I doing this for this person? It's not so selfless anymore because we're kind of doing it because we want them to give us what we're giving them. Yeah. Yeah. And the more we want it, the more we do it for them. Mm. You know, like the more we think like I can earn it somehow, or I can gather it for myself if I do a really, really, really good job. Meanwhile, all that energy we're spending means that we're getting burned out at a faster rate. We're getting resentful at a faster rate. And, you know, I think it's, so often we are trying to root our needs through the people that we're in relationship with, yes. particularly our need for safety. And it's sort of like, you know, our needs, are, it's like a rope. I'm holding the rope and then that person's holding the rope and they start to shake it up and down and move it all around. And there's a lot of friction, a lot of instability. And so I want to take responsibility for their needs and I want to manage their behavior yes. because I am actually trying to mitigate the response and, you know, that that behavior is having on me. Yes. And so it becomes such an unstable way to get our needs met. But whenever we are enmeshed with other people, meaning we're taking responsibility for stuff that's theirs to own and they're taking responsibility for stuff that's ours to own, then we set up this kind of unstable uh, situation where we can't really have our needs met because somebody else is partially in control of them. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that it's really important to begin to parse those things out and 
you know, of course, you know, our relationships were so interconnected, but when we fully take responsibility for our needs and for keeping ourselves safe as much as possible, for example, or, um, meeting our need for love, I mean, is huge. Then we get that feeling of knowing that we can trust ourselves to have our own back yes. no matter what. Yeah. And it's, it's complicated because a lot of people are afraid that if we set up those sorts of relationships, you know, um, does that mean I'm going to have to be by myself or yeah. at the end of all, at all, am I by myself? But, you know, we start our lives and our relationships with ourselves. We end our lives and our relationships with ourselves. And that's the one constant. And so to be in integrity in your relationship with yourself and to really take responsibility for your needs and to have that awareness of, you know, really reclaiming that. So you're not, you know, rooting your most primary needs through other people trying to have them met indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, and that includes that the whole thing of maybe if I'm really, really good, they're going to notice how exhausted yeah. I am and they're going to give me permission to get the rest that I so desperately need instead of taking responsibility for the need for rest and asking for that. Yeah. Oh, there's, you, you dropped so many good nuggets there. It, it you know, feels like, almost like a form of manipulation, right? Like I'm giving, I'm honoring all your needs. I'm giving you everything you want. So now you kind of are stuck with me and now you're going to meet my needs and now you're going to be the safe container that I need you to be. And I think a lot of people pleasing has that kind of thread of codependency of it's not just about me being nice to you. It's me being nice to you because then you kind of owe me. Uh -huh. You are now attached to me. You now um, can, hopefully can love me the way I need to be loved. Because can't you see how much I'm loving you? Can't you see how, how um, selfless I'm being? You know, like you can't leave me. You can't have your... Um, you know, express the satisfaction with me because I'm giving you my all. It, it's a form of manipulation of unconsciously, of course, but um, it's so interesting how exhausting that is versus just being very clear with our needs. And that to me tells me how much unsafe and scary it is to ask for our needs to be met. If we're, we would rather exert so much effort to go into convoluted ways of getting our needs met than just flat out expressing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, this, it's so personal for me. As I was hearing you talk, I was thinking about how for so much of my life, that was my mode of operation was to make myself indispensable. Mm. And making myself indispensable required me to be so, you know, like good with a capital G, yeah. like such a good girl. And how much of myself I sacrificed to be good in an effort to keep myself safe. Yes. And I wasn't aware of any of that. You know, of course, I just, I just knew, you know, people like me better when I'm being really, really good, when I'm doing all the right things, when... You know, I try to make myself skinnier or prettier or <laughs> more compliant, more palatable, uh, less opinions, mm -hmm. um, more selfless. All of these ways that I was conditioned to see how women are valuable. Yeah. And, you know, I think in particular, because I was never thin growing up you know, it seemed like I had to work that much harder because all of my relationships, I was already supposed to feel lucky mm. that anyone wanted me because I didn't have a body that was in accordance to that beauty ideal Fuck. that I had to work even that much harder because it's like an, ap an apology for myself. Yes. And unwinding that and learning how to stop doing that was one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life mm -hmm. because to think like the, the, the real fear of what's going to happen if I stop doing that, 
you know, is everybody going to walk away? Mm. I mean, I would say, of course, you know, like if somebody only likes you because of what you can do for them and not who you are, then let them walk away. But, you know, really being in that is scary and painful. And, Absolutely. you know, you don't want anyone to walk away. You don't even, you, these, these ways of being stay entrenched because we don't want to, to risk it. Absolutely. Because what will then that mean about us? Right. That's what's right. so scary is that what does this all mean? What does it mean about us if who we are, we don't get, you know, the love and support and the nourishment just because of who we are? If we drop these masks and people run, what does that mean? I think this, mm, this relationship is so rich. It is also so personal for me. These are things that I'm currently navigating and have been navigating so I can connect so much of this with the worthiness wound and um, our deep sense of feeling like we don't belong and that we're unlovable. And um, I'm curious your thoughts on, okay, Mara and Thais, fine, I'll express my needs, you know, but this person that I've expressed my needs to can't meet my needs. Now what? Mm-hmm. Which is really tricky. And yeah. You know, I think the, the first thing to keep in mind and to be patient with is that in any kind of relationship renegotiation, there, you know, boundary renegotiation, there is a really awkward period. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for me, it was standing in front of my partner who I'd been together with at that point for four and a half years, we're about two months away from getting married. And I had to say, you know, you don't really know me mm. and that's not your fault. You know, I, I hadn't realized the depths to which I was telling you what I thought you wanted to hear. Again, mind reading, right? Mm. Not even what I know you wanted to hear, but what I was being who I thought you wanted me to be so that you would continue to love me. And whether or not you're having a full blown conversation like that, or you're just saying, I have this need for this one thing, you know, it's, it's shifting the, the relationship. It's renegotiating the boundaries of that relationship. And so I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that there's a rocky period. It's sort yeah. of like we're all going along in a boat. Somebody throws, you know, a suitcase over the side and the boat's going to rock for a while till it regains its equilibrium. And, renegotiating our relationships is the same. Um, but part of taking responsibility for our needs includes um, not taking responsibility for other people's reactions to us. Mm. Because that's really outside of our realm of responsibility. And, you know, protecting other people from their discomfort is like, uh, you know, right out of the people pleasing playbook. Mara, um, you are attacking me. I am not <laughs> appreciating this. This is, I just, I can't anymore. Okay. I can't with the personal attacks. <laughs> I mean, it's like so real for me too. It's so real. You and know, you know, just the, so I've rec I, I learned this. I'm so grateful that I have the friends that I have who are able to reflect this to me. So, um, there was this situation that happened and a friend let me down. Okay. So not on me. Okay. On this person, this person let me down. We were talking about it and I expressed, you know, very uncomfortable for me and I'm learning, but I expressed, Hey, you let me down. This person was like, fuck, I let you down. I'm really sorry. I let you down. My response, Mara, is, you know what, though? Like, I can see how if I had done this, you know, there's some, like, internal thing, like, some psychological thing where I may have wanted you to do that because then it means that this and, – but, but, and I was trying to take responsibility for some part of the, the, the whole situation. And the, my friend, my dear friend, looked at me straight in the eyes and said, I can be with the discomfort that I messed up. 
you don't have to take that away from me. I'm a big person. I can handle this. And that really struck me because I'm a good person who takes self-responsibility and I, you know, want to make sure that these things don't happen again. And how much of that is good, you know, quote unquote, um, helpful. And how much of that is a disguise from letting that person sit with the fact that they fucked up? Mm -hmm. Oh, God, Mm -hmm. that was a powerful moment for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and here's what I've realized about that, too, is there's so much we're transmitting so much respect for other people when we allow them to be responsible for their own feelings. Yes. And I, you know, I was trying to be good. I was trying to be loving. I was trying to be nice. You know, I wasn't trying to tell people (laughs) indirectly that I didn't trust them or respect them to be able to deal with their own stuff. But that's what I was saying when I was taking responsibility for things that weren't mine to own, yes. I was very, very silently, you know, very quietly saying, I don't think you can do it without me. Yeah. And, and, and I also want to add here, you know, taking self-responsibility like I did in a situation that's beautiful and great. And if you're like me and you know, like Mara and you are always looking for how you could be better that's amazing. And that's beautiful. In my case, though, I didn't have to say it right there and then in that moment. I didn't have to take away the attention from that person's discomfort to me claiming responsibility. I could have just let that discomfort sit and maybe at another time or maybe in some other you know, situation, I could have brought up, you know what, and this is what I could do. Right. But the fact that I felt the need in that moment to pull the attention away from that discomfort is a signal to me that I was, like you said so beautifully, I was basically dishonoring their sovereignty. I was dishonoring their ability to be with their stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so important to remember that a lot of times this comes from a really like loving place within us. Yes. It's not that we're trying to hurt somebody or harm somebody or, um, you know, interrupt their autonomy or sovereignty, but, but that is what we're doing. Exactly. Oh, I know. This is, it's so, this is such a big, big, important topic because I see this in everything. You know, I see the ways that we're navigating getting our needs met and meeting other people's needs, being interdependent while honoring our independence, like being connected while wanting to be disconnected, right? While wanting to, to have solitude and have our own space and everything comes down to seeing each other and honoring each other. And we have to start by looking at how we have not been honoring our own needs and how we've been tethering them to other people. So, I, oh my gosh, I just think that this is so applicable in so many ways. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think we've talked about it in a lot of really big context, like a lot of, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the like next level, um, advanced level need tending context. But so much of this has to do with really giving ourselves permission to be in our bodies mm-hmm. and to, to need what we need. You know, the example that just popped up for me um, was how often I used to not even get up and go to the bathroom when I was working because I thought other people were thinking about how many times I got up to go to the bathroom or that it was somehow Mm -hmm. better for me 
to go to the bathroom less or something ridiculous like that. And so, you know, even things that are so primal as drinking water, you know, eating food that we really enjoy, that really nourishes us, um, you know, taking care of our physical selves and believing that we have the right to do that. Um, because, and really not believing, but teaching ourselves that we have the right to do that through our actions. Yes. Because I think for so many of us, you know, we're, we're waiting to take care of ourselves until we get to a point where it feels easier or it feels like, you know, I don't know, we're trying to figure our way to the bottom of it before we get started. Mm -hmm. When in fact, taking care of ourselves in small ways, taking care, starting with taking care of our physical body in small ways every single day, we teach ourselves, we build that, that muscle. We can, you know, unlearn the things that we've been told and relearn things that actually serve us through our actions, uh, which is so much more effective than trying to analyze it, trying to get to the bottom of it. Why don't I do it? What if I think, what if I that? Like starting with really small ways of taking care of ourselves and expanding out from there. Thank you for that, for bringing that, our conversation back down. And I think, yeah, that is how I have found again and again a way for me to ground back into what is real. It's just coming back to how can I honor the needs of my body? How can I listen? How can I cultivate space to be with what is here in a way that feels safe? Um, th that anchor, it's just like meditation. That anchor can can help us in so many ways when we've untethered and when we're lost, you know, we can remember, Oh, let me just come back. Let me just come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And to really acknowledge that, you know, particularly if we're invested in honoring our collective humanity and other people, honoring other people's humanity, that we're not an exception. To that yeah to that humanity that we're mm -hmm. honoring and you know when we when we are able to work on our judgments of ourselves of our own innate messy needy human selves then you know we're we're also able to remedy some of what stands between us and other people yeah um and so so much you know, I think a lot of times people will say, you know, especially in this current moment, historically, politically, will say, you know, that I don't have time to take care of myself even, you know, especially now. There's so much to do. But, you know, part of being in a collective, part of taking care of the people around you means taking care of yourself, too, because you're not separate. Your energy is essential. Um to everything that you care about, to everything that you want to do with your life and reminding yourself that you are not some sort of exception to the rule and caring for yourself as if you're not some sort of exception to the rule is healing too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. I know it has, uh, I know it has impacted me and I, I can only imagine how it will impact our listeners. I appreciate your wisdom. I appreciate the gift that you are in this world. Thank you, Mara, so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was such a juicy, delicious conversation. So good. I just wanted to keep going. <laughs> uh, next time. Next, next time. time. <laughs>